Walters, um, Colm uh, Byrne uh, uh, and Suzanne Marshall um, from Good Shape, who are going to talk about uh, planning um, uh, workforce planning and the work the workforce around about mental health. Um, so interestingly, it's a couple of areas that have been referred to before. Um, staff wellbeing, particularly across the pandemic, and uh, and from Pat's presentation there around about how do we encourage in terms of a work life balance people to uh, uh, people to be interested in the jobs of the future. So, um, uh, uh, good policy around about um, about staff um, staff wellbeing is going to be key to that. So I'll hand over to to Colm and Suzanne to to talk a bit about around about the work that uh, Good Shape have been doing in this area. Um, so, um, Suzanne and I will just introduce ourselves very quickly before we, we, we start. Um, Suzanne, do you want to go first? Yes, yeah, so I'm a Head of Clinical Strategy for Good Shape and my background, I'm an Occupational Health Specialist Practitioner. Okay, I, I'm, um, I'm a freelance HR consultant and I've been working with Good Shape uh, as a consultant since September last year. Uh, I've had a long history in health and social care. I'm a mental health nurse uh, by background. I've been a registered mental health nurse since 1981, um, so 40 odd years now. Um, um, but more latterly, I've worked as the deputy director of HR in a large acute NHS trust. Um, so Suzanne and I are going to take you through a number of slides. Um, so our focus this morning is on mental health uh as an issue um causing significant absence uh particularly in the nhs but across all sectors uh, and all employers um so we're going to give you a number of statistics we're not going to really talk too much to these because they they're easily uh accessible um the data that we're presenting you with is good shape data we collect data from uh, NHS trusts in particular that we engage with where we have uh, over 40,000 uh, NHS employees on our database. Um, so these figures are taken from, from, from that source. Um, but much of this is accessible, as you know, from, from uh, .gov.uk uh, data. Um, but mental health is the number one reason across virtually all sectors, especially including health and life sciences. Um, when I last worked in the NHS, the employer I was with, our absence rates uh, for mental health absence was 30% of all absence. So it, it, it's quite significant. Suzanne, do you want to say any more or should we move to the next slide? Next slide, please. Thank you. So within the NHS, the amount of working time lost to poor mental health has been virtually equal to that for confirmed cases of COVID-19. And of course, we need to, um, you know, um, look into the resource due to the burnout of, of our clinical staff. So looking at the average duration of mental health absence and comparing it with the average duration of absence for COVID related issues, you can see that there's a significant difference. Mental health absence accounts for three times more absence due to COVID. Now, that was as of June 21. Um, we do know that the Omicron variant caused a spike in absences. Uh, and in some trusts, this increased um, by, I think, 38% were, were, were the figures I, I looked at recently. Um, because of the Omicron variant, but fortunately that looks as though it has now peaked and has started to come down. And whilst that was the case and COVID absence peaked, um, there was also a significant increase in mental health loss days uh, of around 10%. So the two do seem to have a, a, a continual relationship. So one in 12 people will actually need time off work for COVID related reasons will then go off um, and take time for uh, poor mental health. And we know that mental health absence actually lasts 63% longer than a COVID absence. And I think you need to make sure you talk to employees um, who are suffering with COVID about looking after their mental health um, at the earliest possible. 
opportunity at the university. So one of the other interesting pieces of data that Good Shape has identified is that when employees go off work with a mental health related absence, so that usually would, would be stress, anxiety or depression, our data seems to suggest that that happens twice. And then if there's a third episode, the employee doesn't return to work. So it's a bit like three strikes and you're out. As an employer, you're given two opportunities, I guess, to get it right with your staff, to support them and get them back to work functioning properly. But if there is a third ep episode, the evidence is that 54% of employees will leave. Now in a climate at the moment with a skill shortage and high vacancy rate, there are few employees, if any, that can afford that, that sort of uh, loss of, of, of skills and people. So we've just heard um, some interesting details from Pat, and we know that the, um, we're going to have the ICSs in the short future. And what we're going to do here is we're going to join the NHS with local government. But interestingly, from our data, we've actually seen an even bigger mental health problem within local government. This sector has actually seen 68% more mental health related absences than the NHS since 2019. So looking forward to um, what is about to, or, or is already in, in place um, as a workforce pressure in the NHS. So clearly we've got the Omicron variant and fortunately that now seems to have peaked uh, and is coming down, although there are still a significant number of patients with the Omicron variant in hospital at the moment. And that will clearly take some time to subside. Um, those of us who've worked in the NHS will be very familiar with our winter planning uh, and the winter flu season and all the joys that that brings. Um, so apart from getting our act together and getting a good flu vaccination programme up and running, every winter, uh, as HR colleagues will know and clinical colleagues will know, um, becomes seems to become longer and longer. In fact, most of you will probably identify as I do with the view that there was no longer a winter peak, that in fact the pressures have become all year round. Um, and some of the reason for that is that um, when people are coming into hospital now and uh, are more elderly and more frail and with a, a range of, of complex uh, cases and, and conditions, um, the ability to discharge them back into their own homes is becoming significantly affected by what can only be described as a crisis in, in social care. Um, so the winter flu season becomes an all round, all year round issue. With COVID now, the, the, the likelihood is that, that we will have to have uh, a booster vaccination programme to include COVID as well as flu on a regular basis. And that is a, a, an unanticipated pressure um, that will now have to be factored into workforce planning uh, for the next few years. Um, you will all know that there's a backlog of elective care. The recent estimates I've heard is that 5 million people are waiting for elective surgery. Um, and that's an enormous burden, um, which is not clearly not going to go away anytime soon. The advent of the, um, it's the ICSs is, um, is, is an interesting one. I was about to say to you this morning that we know that that was in line for April of 2022. Um, although I had some doubts because I had heard that the legislation was delayed. Patricia has just confirmed for us um, that the uh, health and care bill uh, is still a bill, not yet an act, still going through Parliament. The chances of it becoming uh, statute by April, in my experience, now look remote. But when ICS uh, does become uh, statute, those of you in HR will know, as I do, the significance of that for us, because whether we like it or not, there'll be significant review and restructure of existing 
services. And that will include a lot of Tupi transfers, I would imagine. Um, Patricia told us that there's a five-way merger going on between various NHS England bodies, which again, from a HR perspective, adds a level of complexity um, that we hadn't necessarily uh, anticipated. The funding and staffing challenges, our funding challenges are, are ever constant. I just wanted to say a few words about the, um, the VCOD, the vaccination as a condition of deployment for healthcare workers. Um, I don't know if you saw PM questions yesterday, but the Prime Minister was very, very robust in his views. And he had a number of uh, front and backbench MPs saying, will you please delay this? Um, and he said, no, he's absolutely of the view that um, healthcare professionals ought to be vaccinated. There are various estimates of the impact this will have on the workforce. Um, and the estimates I've seen vary between 52,000 and 70,000 NHS staff being unable to be deployed as a result of compulsory vaccination. Um, and, and if you want more information on that, I, I've seen data produced by the Royal College of Nursing. And in fact, there was a panorama program looking at this issue just the other day. So um, that, that is going to be a challenge and how we manage that locally um, is, is going to be very difficult. I know a lot of HR colleagues that have put out advice to say, well, if you're a clinician and you don't want to be vaccinated and don't have a medical exemption, then we will try to deploy you um, to an area where you don't have direct patient care. I mean, colleagues, you must all realize that that is very, very, very difficult um, in the current situation that we're in. Um, to deploy clinicians to non-clinical roles is, is going to be very challenging. So hopefully that's given you um, a flavour of the uh, data that's um, been produced by ourselves to um, match with the, the government data. So that highlighted the problem. What we want to do now is actually try and talk to you about how we can implement some um, change and um, possible solutions and, and support you out there with your workforce planning. So um, using technology to get good data is absolutely key. It's the evidence you need to make um, your informed decisions. We don't want to keep doing what we've always done and we certainly don't want to be guessing. So our data is there to identify and predict hotspots where our mental health is actually um, starting. We want to identify the root causes for a targeted response. We want to combine the data that we've just shared with you um, with other sources so that you're looking at a holistic national view to get the bigger picture. Make informed decisions for an efficient workforce planning and plan your mental health wellbeing strategy, which includes um, a lot of training, not just for your line managers, but your employees as well, to actually recognise if they're suffering with mental health issues themselves. We need to understand who's actually absent, why they're absent, and when they're likely to return to work. We want to make better decisions for more efficient workplace planning. And we want better interdepartmental connections so that we can share best practice. We want more efficient cost cover, block booking as opposed to day by day. And that could help us minimize costs of our administration. Okay, thanks Suzanne. So, so having good data is key. And one of the challenges I faced uh, in the NHS was um, that I didn't always trust the data, in particular ESR, and even if the ESR was, was good uh, and I trusted the data, I actually found a richness in data which was much closer to the source. So, in fact, it will be your staff who tell you the areas where there are problems and mental health hotspots. So you will all know within your own organisations which departments throw up more grievances, more disciplinaries, more disaffected uh, individuals, complaints, et cetera. And when you look at your absence rates, you will almost certainly find that they mirror each other. Uh, and a piece of work I did a couple of years ago, looking at grievances in a large NHS acute trust, showed me that they were arising in areas where there was a high level 
of staff who were in the lower paid bands um, and that they were in the least professionalized areas such as estates, hotel services, um, those sorts of areas. And that should allow you as a HR department to target um, where you put the majority of your prevention resources. So you consult at individual and demographic levels, um, but you also need to use your uh, individual appointments, your return to work interviews to, to really get to the heart of what is going on with somebody's absence um, and not just rely on your policies and procedures that, that that will bring you some sort of resolution. The other thing I would say is that once you've identified um, a particular theme through your data, uh, as, as, as we did with, say, our, our lower banded staff, um, we then look to preventative measures. You know, it's a bit of a cliche, but prevention is better than, than cure. So again, you know, without patronizing anyone, you will all know that it's very useful to have trained mental health first aiders on the ground so that they can at least signpost staff to the sources of support. Um, so if you've got an employee assistance program, for example, um, one of the things that we know is that there's a very poor take-up rate of, of EAPs. Um, and again, just uh, in relation to, to Good Shape and, and the, the organizations that Good Shape works with, uh, we provide an employee assistance process that is accessed by 70% of, of the staff who, who need to access it. Whereas in, in the NHS, it varies between 6 and 10% of, of take up of EAPs. Um, but it's about really getting close to your staff. And, and as I said in the previous slide, finding out exactly what is going on. I'll give you an example of a, of a case that we had where we had, a, we had a, a woman who was frequently absent for short periods and, and then went off with stress. And in the return, well, or the, not the welfare interviews rather, um, what she disclosed to us was actually her stress, anxiety and depression were being caused by uh, a violent partner. And she seemed to indicate that there was virtually nothing we could do to get her back to work because the ex-partner knew where she worked and he knew her shift pattern and he would wait at the bus stop for when she, she got off the bus to come into work. So she couldn't come into work because she was frightened. So we had to make a response to that that fitted with her circumstances. And for a three or four week period, we had a member of our security staff meet her at the bus stop and escort her into work. Um, and that worked really well until the ex-partner um, got the message and then went away. And now that's not obviously a one size fits all. We couldn't do that in all of those types of cases, but it does sometimes mean that you need to think out of the box. You might need to move people from one department to another where maybe they've, they've had some, you know, they may have had previous um, problems in their own department with personalities and so on. Um, I would say that we need to reassess our absence policies to make them fit for each and every uh, particular purpose. Only insofar as, you know, we have in, in HR policies, we have some structures where we say, well, four weeks is defined as long term absence. Why? Why four weeks? If we know it's a recurring stress and depression problem, um, why would we wait four weeks? to you know, maybe get somebody in, refer them to Oc Health or for counselling or to an EAP or whatever. So you know, let's be flexible. Let's keep in touch with our employees, get alongside them um, and make sure that the support we offer is tailor-made for them as individuals. Oh, if I could just add to that, Colin. Um, so what I, I, I really just wanted to say was, I saw a note just now on the chat line just saying mental health is a much bigger picture um, and there's different types of mental health. And um, at Good Shape, we've actually developed um, three different return to work forms because previously, I'm very aware that uh, most organisations have one return to work form that fits um, everybody's conditions. And I've always felt that, you know, to have the most effective meeting, which I mean, return to work is a really important toolkit, um, part of your toolkit for managing mental health. And so we developed three different ones, and one is for bereavement, 
One is for um, stress and anxiety, and one is for um, the other one is for diagnosed mental health conditions. And we found by separating these out, we're actually really understanding the, um, the true root cause um, rather than just um, saying, you know, mental health is just one topic. Um, so, um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that part. Thank you. So, again, this is back on, on, on a similar theme, really, which is around uh, making whatever support service you have visible and easily accessible. Uh, and, and the easier that you can make it to access, then clearly the more, more take up you're likely to get. Um, however, it is pointless referring somebody to occupational health if they're suffering from workplace stress or any other form of stress, if there's a five week waiting list for an appointment. Um, and all too often that has been the case. And it, during the pandemic, clearly the pressures uh, upon occupational health colleagues ha has been uh, exacerbated. So minimizing delays is essential. Um, and, you know, you might want to think again on the basis of reviewing policies and procedures. If somebody identifies a mental health issue as the reason for their absence, that almost should automatically trigger a referral to your support services. So it would trigger them being provided with information about an EAP um, and about being referred to occupational health for an appointment. Um, some work I know by NHS England looking at responses to absence rates uh, indicated that those employers who outsource their, outsource their occupational health provision um, had a lower absence rate. Uh, and a higher take up of occupational health services. Uh, and obviously, you know, Good Shape provides that service. My main point around signposting and referring to support services, I think, is really about having a joined up approach. Um, sorry. Is about having a joined up approach. So, what works for one individual won't work for, for another. And at the start of the pandemic, one of the things that we had in, in my acute trust was we had a, a significant number of volunteers came forward um, to help uh, during the pandemic. Amongst those were some trained psychotherapists and counsellors who offered their services um, free of charge to the NHS for frontline staff. Um, and so that, that was really useful. And we, we, we took that up. We took that offer up. Sorry, Susanna, um, did you want to add anything to the, the previous slide? Uh, yes, um, sorry, on, on the previous slide, um, my main point uh, that I wanted to make is, is that um, you, we want seamless referrals backwards and forwards from our wellbeing partners. And I think it's really important to have um, view and sight of our wellbeing partners. So, you know, may I suggest that you have a wellbeing event day where you actually ask um, someone from your occupational health team, your EAP team, perhaps your fast track feed have them all together in a big group where your staff can have access to them and speak to them long before they actually need the referral because I think it improves confidence and um, understanding um, you know in case they ever do need them and need their help. Thanks Colm. Okay so the next slide um, you'd be pleased to know is the final slide but this and this is aimed really at those of you who are in the HR function or manager function where you have responsibility for oversight of staff um, and to intervene on particularly on on absence rates for a variety of reasons so we talked about the benefits of good data um, and and what that can bring you we talked about the benefits of using the data but alongside that getting close to staff and staff side organizations um, such as trade unions, who have an enormous amount of insight into what's happening on the ground. Uh, and some of the professional associations also have their own support services and counselling services. Particularly, I'm thinking of the RCN and the BMA have their own access to, to good support services. Um, but of course, as we've said already, not everybody, uh, and the effect of, of the pandemic on everybody is not the same some people are more, more affected by it than others. But the NHS had a 30% absence rate for mental health before the pandemic started. 
Um, so this is a, a long-term issue, not a, not a, not a short-term issues. Um, and you know, we certainly do appreciate that HR managers uh, and others are, are under pressure. But I thought it'd be useful for you to think about what is it that clinicians in particular are saying is causing them stress um, and causing absence. So I, I went on a webinar a couple of days ago with the Nurse and the Midwifery Council, and they've identified five key things that are stressing registered nurses at the moment. Um, first amongst those is the enormous sense of responsibility that they feel for others. And particularly when you've got um, a pandemic that has now caused over 150,000 deaths, you do appreciate that our doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals, you know, let's not forget our ODPs, our theatre staff, our radiogra radiographers, our physios, et cetera. They're all witnessing scales of distress and deaths that they probably haven't seen before. Um, so, you know, that sense of responsibility, being a decision maker uh, when people's lives are at stake, um, weighs very heavily on people, not just whilst they're at work, but also, and probably especially after work. The second thing that they said was really stressing them out was that they were crossing red lines all the time. Um, and the, they were doing things this year and last year that they had never done before, that would have been unthinkable, that were outside their normal standard operating procedures and policies because of the context of, of the pandemic. The third thing they said to the NMC was their fear of making wrong decisions. Uh, and what the NMC has tried to do is to say to, to nurses, registered nurses, providing you record what you do and you keep a rationale, you can give a rationale for what you do, and clearly you're acting in the best interests of the patient, then they will take that context into account. The fourth thing they said was accountability uh, and then the consequences of accountability. So, of course, yes, as professionals, we are all accountable. But if you feel that your organization will punish you for making wrong decisions, then that really ups the professional risk to you and makes you feel um, psychologically unsafe in the workplace, which again we know is a key indicator uh, for mental health absence. So one of the things I would say to all of our colleagues, HR and manager colleagues, is work closely with your staff, find out what is going on for them. Um, and I think really thinking back to what we can do on whole systems for supporting mental health, is to relook at the Dido Harding guidance that was issued in 2019. You remember the letter to all chief execs, learning lessons to improve people practices, uh, which followed a, a very tragic case in London. Um, that talked about practicing a just learning culture. So avoiding suspensions, if at all possible, avoiding disciplinaries, if at all possible, uh, and again, that goes back to getting alongside people, finding out what went on. And unless there are examples of willful, willfulness or extreme cases of neglect, the majority of cases can be understood and responded to. It doesn't mean that we don't hold staff accountable. Of course we do. Uh, but in the context of a just and learning culture, we can learn from their mistakes and our own mistakes as systems. The other thing just the mindful, answer, Nicole, Colum, just mindful of the time for our colleagues here with their 25 minutes. <laughs> right. The final thing I will say then is that the NMC uh, have expressed to managers that practice the duty of candor um, and explain to the staff if things are going wrong, why they're going wrong, and what measures they're going to put in place to support them in future. Sorry, I've rambled on a bit. <laughs> I had some things to add to this slide, but I, I think we're just very close to our time. So. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. 
Thanks very much uh, to Colm and Suzanne um, for their uh, for their presentation. Um, there's been some interesting comments in terms of the chat functions around about some of the things that you're touching in terms of uh, PTSD and categorization, broad categorization of, of, of mental health. Um,